Um, my name is Zora Rodriguez. I'm a front-end solution architect at Adesso, Adesso Austria. Um, and I'm also open source developer. The list could not fit in here in the projects that I'm working with or that I own or did contribute. So if you want to check me out, just uh, look up on GitHub or Twitter. Um, yeah, so I think we're set. We're ready to start. Recording is working. Everything is fine. People have, everyone has uh, a drink. Last time? No, last chance. Let's grab a drink. Now is the time. Cheers, prost. So this is a great, great thing from the sponsors. Always paying the bills. That's a good stuff. They should always do that. So let's talk a little bit about GraphQL in the enterprise, from the legacy environment, RESTful APIs to bleeding edge technology. Right? I know this is a Vienna JS meetup, and. Um, I don't know if you know um, about GraphQL that the reference implementation was first have uh, was first released from Facebook in JavaScript, not in another language, but in JavaScript first, and it's since then being uh, the reference implementation for all specifications in GraphQL. So this has a lot to do with JavaScript. And next thing is that JSON is also a JavaScript object oriented object. It's the next thing that has a lot to do with JavaScript here. So, but this will be a talk about how to introduce this kind of new technology um, in an environment that does not welcome it. So let's go over it. Please help me do this talk um, by just giving feedback while making some questions because I cannot know how much you know from GraphQL, how much you know from the other technology I, was, I will be talking about. So it's just very welcome that you are proactive with me here. All right? Yes? You guys ready? Let's do this. So enterprise issues of modern times. Let's start with the big problem. What problem do we have? Um, first of all, before we get to that, I have seen that many of you guys do photos with the cell phone about the slides. So this slide is running now live on this URL. If you check it out with your cell phone, uh, Google Chrome has it like in the URL bar that you can uh, make a photo of a QR code and you get directly the, the URL. So you can check out, make screenshots of the, of the, the links and stuff you want to have. It's not, not big of a deal, but I think it's uh, just not a lot of effort to do this. So could maybe be a standard in the future. Um, GraphQL in the enterprise. So what's the problem actually? Yeah, simply said, you guys want to know it? Let's do this. This is the problem. One day, enterprise woke up and understood, shit, our users know better quality, better standards in every way than we are doing since, since the beginning of time. And it started with Facebook, it started with iOS, it started with Mozilla, it started with the web, actually. And the web being the leader here in defining uh, standards for data consumption, UIs, and stuff like that. So the employees inside the enterprise companies, and when I say enterprise, you know, guys, what, what this is, does this mean? Yep. Yeah? It's like bank, insurance, yeah, a lot of big companies that have internal, like, thousands of users using software that the public will never see. And they are using this kind of software to do their work, basically, on every day, every time. So. Someday they understood that, well, 90% of our users, even, even the, the, the seniors one, with 70 year old, old, old guys, uh, know, know how to share photos with their kids. But it's impossible to upload a file in the system. So yeah, it's what happens if you just look away all the time of, uh, um, of this stuff, right? Oop, I'm, I'm new with the slides, so let's go down. Enterprise, is enterprise issues of modern times. Let's put it to a little bit more edge points here. So legacy RESTful FBI REST is already in place and not going anyway, anytime soon. This is established in the enterprise. You can do almost everything inside enterprise companies with REST. Even some admins don't know that some software they put in place have REST APIs. But if they discover it, let's use it somehow. Doesn't mean if it's, um, it's, if it's secured, it's uh, encrypted, or it's uh, with credentials, credentials, they just use it. Why? Because it's very simple, right? 
You just uh, fire it up, make a request, and you get the response. That's it. You don't have to do anything further. Backend to backend uh, developers and infrastructure are mostly like, never change a running system. Why should we do that, right? It's working, man. What do you want from us? Everything is fine. We will not change this. Don't, 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 don't matter what you say. Because everything you're saying now, we did it 20 years ago. We're just reinventing the wheels. Well, you know what? They're right. You shouldn't change a running system. And we are reinventing the wheel. But this is the core problem of everything here. And I will talk a little bit about this later. Um, lack of data models and type definitions. Most of the time, you come to a client, a customer, and he has a lot of data, right? Because they have the data, right? About you and me and everybody else and the business. But no one did a, a type definition model for it at the beginning. Basically, using databases as our silos. It just throw stuff in. And somehow you will get it out. You don't know what you have and what type you have, but you have the data. Here's the report. So when you have this kind of environment, it's almost impossible to get, come to them and say, hey, let's use GraphQL because you know what? It's fancy. It's not going to work. It doesn't matter who you are. So you have to uh, understand or find a way to integrate and adapt into the system. And this is basically what I do at my job. Time upgrade, time to upgrade. Um, yeah, even if you convince a guy, let's say your admin guy says, yes, we want to do it, and he gets the budget, it will take him years to do that without breaking production. And if he's doing that, he's a wise guy because he's using a migration plane. And that's something everyone should do. But you want to wait years for the new UI that's coming up? You can't. So another problem of enterprise uh, is bottom-up solutions, right? You come to us, you say what kind of APIs you want, you front-end developers, and we will deliver it. Maybe not in the way you want, but the data will be there. That's the bottom-up approach. Like, you need one API, one concern, division of logic, and stuff like that. Only the data that you need, and they offer you, look, we have one API with, let's say, 300 calls. You can, you can make a combinational set of them. And for one data set or one model of a profile of a person, you have to make, like, five requests, maybe, if you're good if you understand and read our documentation, if we have any. So it's not designed for any business concept or any business approach at all. Any business model is not involved in this. It's totally host near. It's totally in the sense of we have the data of a profile, of a name, um, linked to this and that and that, and we will offer exactly that in HTTPT. HTTP. Can, better, can do this better in German. So, you guys with me? Makes sense, right? Let's get there. So, um, I want to I wanna, uh, cite, cite, cite you, my, my, my beloved uh, professor, one of the best, um, uh, Peter Purgethofer. And I will say this in German, try to translate it in English, please. Uh, you have, have a better translation, just come up to me. Als Informatiker sind wir Teil der Lösung und Teil des Problems. Hier fehlt Teil, haha, das muss ich ausbessern. Aber es ist gesagt, we are part of the problem and part of the solution as computer scientists. Why is that? Because at a certain point, we don't see UX, UI as a normal consumer or as, like, as a consumer. We say it as computer science. We understand what's going on behind the scenes. And this is, is, can be good, but this can also drive you into uh, a minimalistic way of thinking of what is really needed for the data consummation or for the representation of a certain business model. So remember I said we will talk about the key, the key point of the problem? That's exactly it. When the backend guy says never change a run running system, they're right. You, don't sh you shouldn't do that. You can make a migrate plan to make a transition, yeah, because that's stable and business needs this kind of stability. But on the other hand, UI and front-end development will never settle 
Why? Because our needs change. We as a consumers, we always go on and on and on and search a new, better way to consume data, easier, faster, more semantic, more interpretive, more self-describing. This has nothing to do with technology in its core. It has to do with how humans perceive information and consume information. So this will go on forever. So what are the enterprise needs of modern times? The first class user experience, no matter what they do, they cannot achieve that without certain kind of approach, which we will talk in a moment. Front end first architecture layer. Basically, the whole thinking right now in the enterprise is, yeah, you will bundle me your JavaScript, we will put it there, you have an API, go. Yeah, wait a moment, we, have, we, need, um, we need this bundle for the different kind of client, we need this uh, network layer for this dif different kind of app. Uh, we need basically one point of concern, not many. Um, can we improve that? Can we measure that? Can we make it faster? No, it's actually what we have. So we're just passing every request on the front end to the back end. Yeah, that's it. They're not thinking that uh, maybe their APIs should be driven by another kind of focus. And this focus is to serve front end apps, right? APIs which are designed and optimized for the consumption and transportation of data. This is exactly one of the needs that the enterprise has. APIs which are self-learning learning and improve the development speed. Exactly the key points that GraphQL can help you with. How many guys uh, here have worked with GraphQL? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Thanks. It's very good. So one third, something like that. Uh, you know, I did ask, have worked with it, not played, because there is a big buzz around GraphQL, right? Introduction and enablement of attractive technology. I will mention this, this has nothing to do with GraphQL, but that it is really serious. Um, if you look at the Stack Overflow um, uh, statistics of 2018 and, 2000, um, and, and all the years before, there is a high number of people wanting to learn new technologies, sometimes above 70. I'm talking not here about students, okay? I'm talking here about people in the field. They want something new. So if you have a neighbor near you right now, you ask him, you ask him if he's happy with his technology because 17%, even if it's 60, you know? Um, this means that we need this, we need to learn, we need to improve, right? And this uh, kind of diversion or illusion that backend and fronting is just black and white is just not true. We should work together and improve things to make better user experiences. So JavaScript is sex most, second most wanted to learn programming language of 2018. It's not that I already, that I already can do it, that I want to learn. That's the statistic. Check the statistic out, it's in, out in the link. Self-descriptive documentation along with type safety. Remember what he said for, uh, before the talk? There is so much, so much errors, uh, how to say, um, sources that you can completely eliminate with type safety. You will maybe get some few more, but not more than before. With every change, there is, uh, with every adaptation, there, is, there are new edge points to it. There are new stuff to learn. There are new things that you have to consider. But you can eliminate a lot of problems just with type safety. And this is what GraphQL brings you. In a network layer, type safety. But where to start? How to introduce GraphQL into the enterprise? There are many ways and approaches in which GraphQL can be introduced into an enterprise environment. Um, um, this time, we're going to talk about how GraphQL can be introduced on top of a legacy RESTful API without changing the running system, all right? So bleeding edge integrated into an enterprise environment. So how to introduce this, how to do that with a RESTful legacy system? Start with Swagger. You, know, you, you guys know what Swagger is? Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I think, I think half of the people maybe. Um, what is Swagger? 
Well, Swagger is actually an approach to exactly do that, to cover the, the needs of modern times that the enterprise has, right? Documentation, being self-descriptive and all this stuff. Um, it's decoupled, it's not inside the technology. It's something that you have to do after you have created your REST API. Or when creating your REST API, you have to describe it, but it's not in the typings, right? It's both human and machine uh, readable with an interactive API, stuff like that. And we will get to our first demo to see what it can do and what it cannot do. Just a quick overview, but we're going fast to this. So let's start Swagger. What I do have here is a Swagger UI. You can check out the website. It will, it will lead you to here. But in the Swagger UI, what you can see is just a possibility to start the live demo. What this live demo will do is uh, it will load this JSON object over here, pass it to the UI, and um, um, fill this UI with live by the definitions in the JSON file. What's inside this JSON file? If you guys don't have seen it, I have it prepared here. It's basically this. It's a Swagger file with a version number defining every kind of call you can make in this REST API that is somewhere. And this somewhere is exactly here defined. It's pet store, Swagger.io, and the context. So, and uh, we have tags, I'm not getting into it, which shims are supported, and then we have the first path. The path is a path of type post, and if I make a HTTP request there with the type post, and I pass on the correct payload, I get a certain response. And even the response is defined in here. So as you can see, it helps to describe this kind of API that I otherwise have to do in a markdown, or in documentation, or in a Word document, and this kind of documentation is being generated for you. So if you code your REST API with certain annotations and certain informations in your code, let's say Java API function this and that, and then you make an annotation and say this is a get request. This is a get request with following parameters, and then you pass on the interface. Then Swagger will get into your code, read it, and generate this file for you. All right, are we there? Make sense? So what I do is, uh, in this case with Swagger, I program my API and I get the output in a certain standard format. So let's go to the pet store. Horrible. I have here a pet store. This is a RESTful API documentation via Swagger, and I have never called, let's say I have never called this REST API, but I want to get some data. Let's pick something. I want to find pet by status. No, it's boring. I want more. I want the inventory. I want the whole inventory. What I can do here in this UI is it gets pre-populated with the information from the JSON file, telling me an example about the model in JavaScript, of course, where I can see, OK, this is a kind of key maps thing, thing where I can pass almost any kind of value as a key and a value. So it doesn't tell me much. Um, but here I have an like, example. So it, it speaks more to me. It's more self-describing. And I know what the response type will be. And now I will say, let's try this out. I will try this out and see what happens. I will execute. And in the moment that I execute, what happens? I get here my response code and my value. And the same thing, the exactly same thing I can do in the terminal. I just have to get this one. Maybe you guys know C URL, or as I call it in German, Zwill. You can just put it there, fire it up and you get your beautiful JSON object. <laughs> Human readable, right? I love it, I love it, it's just good. So this is the minimum uh, example of Swagger Pet Store. So now let's say this enterprise, env enterprise environment has Swagger, it has done this kind of work, because Swagger is already in the enterprise. So is there a way to take this file and kind of pass into GraphQL? Yes, there is. Let's take a look. Swagger is key in this approach, and it brings many features and stuff, but it's definitely not enough. We need more, we need more swag. So 
Let me introduce you to Swagger to GraphQL, where I am also a contributor. And um, you can also check out this link where there is a Medium uh, blog posting about this whole thing. It's really nice. And this is the fastest way from legacy to GraphQL. Let's do a demo again. Now with visual code, let's see if it works. So what I will do here is I will start my code like Swagger to GraphQL, VNHS. And what I have here is just uh, one Node.js file, one JavaScript file, package JSON, of course, with everything inside. Not Verdaccio yet, but I think I will try to, I will, I will check that out soon. But let's take a look on Swagger to GraphQL, right? Do we have it here? We do have it here. No, that's not. That's it. That's Swagger to GraphQL. Uh, it's a really cool library. If you want to play with it, if you want to abstract some kind of um, um, uh, REST API that you want to build in into your Graph GraphQL modules. So Swagger to GraphQL um, has an example here of the page. And we will take exactly that example, put it in an index file, adapt some paths and run it. And what will happen is this, we will be able to consume this REST API without having written any kind of JavaScript. This is, this cannot be, this is just, um, this snippet is just a configuration for Swagger to GraphQL. So let's take a look. We're doing it live. Never have done that. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, size, yes. What, what should I attend uh, next? Studio. In the back? Will you go? Yeah, it's better. I can make it bigger. So what you guys see here is basically what have I done? Let's, let's start from, no, I will not start because we don't have uh, uh, that much time. I will not restart, but what have I done? I have downloaded the Swagger JSON file. And this Swagger JSON file is here. It's not human readable, but we can format it. Um, there is one kind of type being not accepted because of the JavaScript JSON um, uh, limitations. I will change that because I know it. I have to change that. And I will go to the, my index file where I have the dependency and everything already loaded. I'm sorry for that now. It's jumping over here and there. And I will tell him which is the proxy URL where is my JSON file with all the description we have seen? I will pass it on to Swagger to GraphQL. I will get my schema. This is this one. Let's close this, right? People can see it better. Let's close it completely. I will get my schema and I'm good to go. This is already the acceptable uh, schema from GraphQL with all the resolvers. What happens in the background is that Swagger to GraphQL parses this uh, uh, information from Swagger, understands all the descriptions needed to make an, um, a request to this, to this server, and creates the JavaScript functions, resolver functions for GraphQL. So all I need to do is to start it and we have a GraphQL. Let's see if it works, let's see if it's true. Uh, is this the one? No, it's not the one. Is this the one? No. Is this the one? Yes, it is the one. Let's check the URL. Let's make it a little bit bigger. It's up and running. That's it. I could have done it also in 30 seconds. Any one of you. Of course, you need time to understand both of technologies. But the amazing thing is that it's compatible. And you can make it more and more compatible with time, with color types. So now I know there is a certain object with this ID. Um, let's fetch it. And what happens? It got fetched from this pet store API. There's nothing running here on my computer. I have all the description of all queries, find pets, get pet by ID, get inventory. Remember the inventory stuff we saw? It's also telling me everything that will come back as a response. 
if I want to know, okay, what's in the order? Um, no, that doesn't impress me, it doesn't interest me. What's the pet ID? What's the pet? Uh, oh, look, I have the category. Let's fetch the category. You just go there and fetch the category. No problem. It's parsing for you, transporting only what you have requested, right? And um, in a manner that you can, as a developer, always decide and type safe and self describing. So, this is one approach. We were done for the day. I am kidding. We have more approaches, many more. So, let's go on. So what's the demo? So, Agatha to GraphQL makes it possible to translate an integrated legacy RESTful API into GraphQL by generating a schema. Let's say you have a resolver function and you want to intercept this resolver function, this request. You want to always validate the credentials, you want to validate the inputs. Then you can write your own resolver functions, right? Mm, that matches with this schema. And this is exactly what you can do also with Swagger to GraphQL. Let's go back. So let's say, okay, that's good, but these magic resolvers are kind of spooky for me. I want to see where the magic happens. I want to see, okay, this, is, this request is doing get inventory with ID, blah, 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 and this and that, and the response and the model. I want to take, to take care of this myself. Then no problem at all. All you have to do is to, do, 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 do. Nope. use Swagger to GraphQL to generate a types GraphQL from the Swagger file. I'm going to press enter here. It got generated. And now what I have is a GraphQL schema definition. Let's look for the pet. Pet, where are you? No, pet searching skills. Here's the pet. ID, category, name, photo URLs, everything. I haven't done nothing to do this. It's all being generated because someone in the back end one day just say, we are doing this definition, right? It's not front end focused, but we are doing our job. So this helps a lot. And this can be improved in many ways. You guys with me? You get that? All right, let's get to the next point. So. If you have this, then the solutions that you could make here, the approaches that you could have here, are not far away. So the generated GraphQL schema can be used in any GraphQL module. You are free to any kind of GraphQL technology then. This is where we get to the amazing Nest.js framework. If we talk about uh, GraphQL, we talk about REST, we talk about legacy, and we talk about bleeding edge, and the enterprise, it means that we want to cover those needs, but not uh, by introducing other problems. So we have to choose not yet another framework syndrome, framework, whatever, so on someone that fits our needs. And this is clearly the enterprise needs. While there are, uh, there are a lot of libraries, helpers, and tools for Node.js, none of them effectively, effectively solve the main problems in the architecture. Nest.js aims to provide an application architecture out of the box, which allows to a effortless creation of highly testable, scalable, loosable, loose, loosely coupled, and easily maintainable applications. Um, it's true. Nest.js helps you a lot in managing big application in a OOP way, a way object orientation uh, oriented manner. In a, in, a, in, in a way that is re reusable, in a way when you have, for example, you have your client, you have your GraphQL endpoint, right? And then you have not one legacy API, you have one, you have two, you have three, you have four, you have five. And you have to abstract them and you have to give it a certain logic that it will be optimized and asyn asynchronous for the client, for the front-end application, right? So. When you have a structure like this, um, here's the same actually, this is just um, fancier. Um, I asked Uri Goldstein if I could uh, put some slides from, from him from his new project and stuff he's doing. 
And he has some recommendations for me what I should, should link to you guys. I will do it at the end. But um, this is another example, right, or a representation of what I'm talking. You have Apollo Server 2.0. You have your resolver functions doing all the heavy lifting for you. And then you have data sources. You have DB, data model. And you want to you, you use that. You don't want to have one GraphQL model for this application fetching data from the same database as the next application the next morning. So you want to share it. You want to improve that, right? So. This is why, in my opinion, SGS is a perfect match for the enterprise. The division of concern, data logic transport layer, helps you cover all this reusable layer, helps you to cover all these reusable needs. Create reusable logical parts. You can work in one part of your network layer completely separated from someone else without getting in conflict. Um, I will just fly over here a little bit. I think this is very much self-describing. But here's the points again of uh, object-oriented programming, functional programming, and stuff like that. And this is so fancy, actually, that um, trust me, if you don't know NestJS, I will start here a, 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 a code of it, a project of it. And you will see it, it's just by navigating it and me talking a little bit, uh, you into it, you will understand the structure of the project and kind of make sense of what it's doing. So let's go to the demo first. Before the demo, I will show you guys some stuff that is maybe interesting for the NestJS. Let's look it up. Just go to nestjs.com. It has an enterprise focus, so also supported. That's also always a topic that companies want also to pay for it when they need the support or they, they need the support and are willing to pay for it. Um, and you have a documentation page, which I very much recommend. It's really good. Um, and the best part here is uh, with GraphQL, right? Quick start. How do you define your models? How do you load your GraphQL schemas and stuff like that? So this is the documentations page. And on GitHub, for starters, I recommend this very much. There is also many samples and projects you can start with. There's a TypeScript, Swagger project, GraphQL project. You just go here on the sample. Sample? Is that sample? Yes. And you see, there you have. You can also run NestJS with a different um, uh, module um, framework. You can do it directly with Webpack. You can do it with Babel. GraphQL, Apollo, and all the stuff like this. And for our project, for example, or many projects in which I have been with GraphQL, we defined one data structure, one logic, and we were able to expose those data in any kind of transportation method, WebSocket, HTTP, whatever. And it was really easy to define the model and stuff like that. I am almost over with the time. Uh, time is running. So let's start the project. Evan, folder, so this is the pro project structure. Let's start with the first one that everyone can relate to. It's the main TS, right? So what do we have here? My application module. And for the ones who knows Angular, for example, as soon as you're inside, you will see, okay, here have certain kinds of definitions of what they can do and cannot do like uh, dependency management, provider functions, and stuff like that. We can go on and take a look at the CATS module, which in the next will have the CATS resolvers. And here we have the result of resolvers. Doing all this heavy lifting that Swagger to GraphQL did automatically. But of course, this has another focus. It's also perfect for the enterprise. I have here also my GraphQL schema in TypeScript, which can be very useful for client applications to type checking before building it. Um, that's it with this demo. Let's move forward. Am I right here? I'm not right here. Here I am. So 
Word to the wise, it is important to note that GraphQL is not a substitute for REST. In fact, um, the GraphQL framework uses REST to transport the payload, which can be then handled by the server internally. So it's not about the transportation method, it's about the way the API is describing it. Um, but um, you should know that for backend developers to introduce GraphQL can be very difficult because they are not into it, this um, new or front-end technologies, and sometimes um, the learning curve can be very stiff. For the approaches that I definitely recommend, and we can maybe check it out on our, on our next talk, uh, is uh, about GraphQL Code Generator. GraphQL Code Generator is uh, um, a library that actually helps you to um, transform um, your schema to anything you want. Anything. With free marker template, I believe, and it's very helpful for uh, enterprise applications that have the need to rewrite the network layer in another manner. Code, gen, generator. Um, you can also try it out on the homepage. There are very nice tutorials about this, how you can get from a graphical schema into basically anything you want. And they mean it, and it's really impressive. So as you see, there are many possibilities to uh, come along with legacy APIs and uh, provide the kind of features that you need for the front-end developer team in a modern way that is reusable, that is type safe, but it also don't break the production system. I think that's it for my talk. Let's check it out. That's all for today. Um, thank you very much for listening. And feedback is welcome.